All right, that's not gonna stop us. We're gonna share screen and I'm gonna maximize again. Okay, so, um, all right, then good morning again. And so um, the topic of my work is um, multi-axial real-time hybrid simulation framework for testing nonlinear structure systems with multiple boundary interfaces. And so a more low level title would be development of an experimental testing methodology for simulating the behavior of structures under natural hazard excitations in laboratory settings. Before we get started, I would like to thank the audience, including my uh, PhD advisor, Dr. Bill Spencer, for the opportunities that have been given over the past four years, including his guidance and mentorship. I would like to thank the uh, distinguished committee members, Dr. Bergman, Dr. Dyke, Dr. Kwan, and Dr. Fonstock for their availability and valuable feedback, and all the audience members for taking this time. Uh, the schedule for today will be as follows. I will uh, present my PhD content. There will be an audience Q&A session, and then there will be a committee Q&A session. So here's the layout uh, for the, uh, for the uh, presentation today. Uh, I will uh, talk about uh, some of the motivation for my PhD work. I will then present some of the methodologies and tools that I use. I will then present some experimental results and leave with some concluding remarks. All right, so what are my motivations and really what got me to do uh, the research that I did? Um, when it comes to natural hazards, every state is exposed to one or more of a host of hazards. As it pertains to our infrastructure, uh, we are typically interested in hazards like earthquakes, tornadoes, and hurricanes. So what I have here on the right is the a map of the U.S. population centers, which roughly corresponds to where a lot of the U.S. infrastructure is. So what I'll do now is I will overlap this map with a, a map of earthquake uh, hazards here in the U.S. So what you can see is that a considerable size of the country and the population is actually within this uh, earthquake hazard. Now, what I'll do is I'll replace this with a, a map of the tornado hazard. And again, you can see even a bigger area. So um, when it comes to natural hazards, it's really important for us to include them in our design manuals and to uh, have them in mind going forward. And so when it comes to design manuals, we always um, start off by uh, solving some sort of engineering challenge. Uh, we conduct research, we propose engineering solutions, uh, we conduct experiments. From those experiments, we draw scientific deductions, which we review with scrutiny until certain elements of the research ends up getting added to the design manual 10, 15 years down the road. But what I really like to talk about today is the whole notion of experimentation and uh, a very specific kind of experimentation. And this is called hybrid simulation. Um, hybrid simulation is an attractive experimental tool proposed to overcome limitations of the quasi-static testing and incorporating system level interactions into experiments and the often unnecessary requirement uh, by the shake table testing methodology for testing an entire structure. So with this framework, you have a complete reference structure that is broken down into a numerical component and a physical component. And at every time step, the boundary condition, which we call the target boundary condition, uh, between the physical and numerical components are calculated and imposed by actuators on a physical specimen. And the forces that we get from the physical specimen are picked up by sensors and fed back to the numerical substructure to close the loop. And so if we do this correctly, and if we capture the dynamics of the specimen and the numerical model, it's as if we tested the entire structure as a whole. And um, over the years, this method has proven to be very repeatable. Uh, it's very flexible. You could do all kinds of testing with it. And also it's space and cost effective. Now, over the years, um, a number of expansions have been added to the hybrid simulation methodology. These include multi-axial uh, capabilities for capturing three-dimensional material envelopes and uh, system level interactions. Uh, there is the real uh, time implementation for capturing dynamic and rate dependent uh, behavior of materials. And also there have been different discussions on substructuring uh, on, you know, including possibilities of having more than one physical to numerical uh, interface. Now, uh, over the years, very sophisticated actuated systems have been developed uh, for the purposes of substructuring and for meeting a lot of the modern uh, research needs. Um, for instance, at the University of Illinois, we have the load and boundary condition boxes, which can impose forces and boundary conditions in six degrees of freedom. At the University of Toronto, they have the UT10 10, 10 element hybrid tester, 
Um, at Lehigh, they have the uh, multi-story test bed. At the University of Minnesota and uh, Swinburne University of Technology in Australia, they have the multi-access uh, sub-assemblies testing facilities, uh, which are also very capable of doing hybrid testing. Now, in most materials, the mechanical properties of the material are dependent on the rate of loading. This is called rate dependence. Uh, it certainly exists in many modern materials like glass fibers, uh, carbon fibers, uh, metal foams, and it also exists in um, isolating and dissipative devices. So if you're thinking about dampers, they are very much rate dependent. Now, when it comes to classic materials uh, such as steels and concrete, uh, the challenge of classifying material, material rate dependence is actually twofold. One is whether the rate dependence happens at typical loading frequencies of the natural hazard. And the second is whether the rate dependence makes a significant enough difference to run experiments in real time. Uh, because of course, running experiments in real time is considerably harder and there are issues with uh, instabilities and so forth. And again, another consideration is the consideration of multi-axial testing. Often we're interested in the three-dimensional material strength envelope. Um, which can be very different from the two-dimensional one. Uh, we are often loading a structural in a biaxial way, so the demands on a structural element uh, will be uh, different because there can be coupling in the X and Y directions. So both capacity and demand will change in the multi-axial setting. So over the years, uh, a number of literature has come out in the hybrid simulation domain, which I'm not gonna cover all, uh, but I will cover uh, some of the significant ones and some of the ones that are notable and relevant to my research. Um, in the uh, 70s and 80s, uh, the first uh, formulations of hybrid simulation came out and really those were called uh, pseudodynamic testing at the time. And they were very primitive just due to the computational capabilities available at the time. Um, in the 90s, uh, computers were finally affordable enough and, uh, and strong enough that we could do real-time hybrid testing. And Nakashima was the very first instance of real-time hybrid simulation, which also happens to be the focus of my work as well. Uh, Dimmick et al. in 99 introduced effective force testing where the inertial component of a numerical model was calculated and imposed via force control on a physical specimen. And then came developments on multi-actuator RTHS and multi-actuator plus multi-physical interface uh, hybrid simulation. And some of these were done in, at slow speed uh, at the very beginning. Uh, in our own research group with Dr. Spencer, we have had uh, a number of developments, uh, mostly in model-based real-time hybrid simulation, where a model of the physical interface uh, or physical substructure is actually incorporated into the numerical setting. And so uh, there was a development in 2007 by Carrion et al. in a one-actuator uh, setting. There was a three-actuator setting by Phillips et al. Uh, in uh, 2013, and also uh, my uh, former colleague, Dr. Fermandua, uh, developed the first uh, sort of generalized multi-axial RTHS framework in 2017, but that one had instability issues, which I will get to very soon. So looking at the big picture, a general approach for RTHS to accommodate realistic boundary conditions, several physical interfaces and specimens is not available. And I'm gonna take this statement and break it down into uh, gaps in knowledge, which, which I will then try to solve. So these are the gaps in knowledge that I've broken down. And I spent uh, the past four years of my PhD trying to solve uh, the, the different elements. So there is the actuator compensation component. Um, so actuators have minds of their own. You wanna compensate for their dynamics. And uh, ideally you wanna have an actuator compensation algorithm that has good reference tracking and it has stability and robustness features. And usually these two objectives are at odds. If you improve one of them, the other one goes back. Um, there is the multi-axial condition. Uh, so uh, we're often interested in uh, three-dimensional testing, three-dimensional material envelopes, and devices that impose these, uh, these uh, forces are, um, uh, they have kinematic coupling in them that you need to solve. Um, different discussions on boundary interfaces with the possibilities of having multiple physical specimen, multiple boundary interfaces uh, were also attractive to me. And so my research objectives really became uh, the ones that I've listed here and expanding on the developments in hybrid simulation and also addressing the gaps in knowledge. Um, I have, uh, I spent my PhD working on the development of a multi-axial real-time hybrid simulation uh, framework, and I'm gonna call this MARTHS. Uh, 
uh, with multiple boundary interfaces for three-dimensional nonlinear dynamic testing of structures, which, as you may imagine, ca can have uh, numerous applications for natural hazard engineering. And again, this is broken down into subcomponents. Uh, so there is the creation of a model-based compensator. Uh, model-based compensators have been used in our group widely. So we have a lot of trust in them, and I stuck with that. Developments of numerical constructs and developments of the physical and experimental constructs necessary to make the uh, overall objective possible. And at every time step or at every uh, uh, step, I'm going to validate via experimentation. So in my prelim exam and in my dissertation, I have talked about some of the developments I've already had in, uh, uh, in model-based control and um, adaptive uh, model uh, reference control. Uh, there was a shake table acceleration tracking study that I did. And then I took the study and I uh, made it into an RTHS study where the two stories are numerically modeled and the nonlinear energy sink device on the roof is uh, physically tested. Uh, there was a study that we did with colleagues from Sweden where we had um, a magnet or rheological damper used for vibration mitigation of a high-speed railway bridge, and that was an interesting study. Uh, and then as part of my prelim exam, I also did a simplified uh, multi-axial RTHS test. But I'm really not going to focus on those. My primary focus here is uh, the multi-interface, uh, multi-axial RTHS today. So this is what I'm going to talk about. All right, so let's get to the methodologies and tools that I use as part of my PhD. But before I get there, I wanna talk about the challenges that I had to deal with. So a lot of the actuator compensation algorithms out there are actually very hard to work with. The algorithms are very sophisticated. So my goal uh, as part of my PhD became uh, creation of a control solution with good tracking, stability, and robustness, which built on traditional control techniques. Cause I was not interested in algorithmic sophistication and but I still wanted to make use of modern control breakthroughs. So why do we use actuator compensation? It's because actuators are in fact uh, hydraulic devices that are robots and robots will never listen to you. When you uh, may give them a command there will be time delays between the measured and um, the target command or the reference command and also you may have amplitude discrepancies and when it comes to a closed loop system delays actually result in uh, negative damping, uh, which can be, uh, which can affect the stability of the system. The next challenge that I had to solve is the challenge of uh, multi-actuator dynamic coupling. Uh, so whenever you have an actuator uh, that, uh, or whenever you have a set of actuators that are connected by a rigid link, uh, because each of the actuators has a mind of its own, when one of them is pushing or pulling, all the other ones will be pushing and pulling as well. So this makes the task of compensation much more challenging. And so here I'm showing uh, the action of one of them and how all the other ones will move as well. And lastly, it's the challenge of having multiple boundary interfaces. Uh, so uh, ensuring that the boundaries in a substructured system, so again, this is your reference structure and this is your substructured system and ensuring the boundaries of this uh, substructured uh, system uh, correspond to the domain and the boundary of the original system, that's a sophisticated task and it hasn't really been explored for real-time hybrid simulation. And that's something I focused on. And so some of the numerical and theoretical constructs that I used uh, as part of my research were uh, the model-based compensator. Uh, this was something that was done in our group. So I had great trust in it and I stuck with it. Because we use model-based compensation, I had to system identify my physical uh, substructure. I needed to take advantage of uh, robotic concepts like kinematic transformations, because um, of course, when you're dealing with uh, actuator devices that are like parallel manipulators, you need to uh, command and Cartesian coordinates and also be able to uh, adjust the actuator strokes so that the Cartesian realization is possible. Um, there is finite element analysis modeling. I had to do three-dimensional FEM analysis for some of the later studies that I did in the numerical uh, substructure. Now, of course, when you're doing multi-axial testing, you want to have a multi-axial test bed. So on the experimental construct, I was uh, interested in using the load and boundary condition boxes that we have here at U of I, um, most notably the smaller ones that we have in the knee studio here uh, that have dynamic capabilities, and we have multiple of them. I need a physical specimen and I decided to stick with steel. Steel is very, uh, first of all, it's very affordable. It's uh, very repeatable. And unlike concrete, you don't get as much variability in your performance. Uh, 
And there are sensors that are uh, attached to this framework, including external potentiometers. And uh, there are also uh, load cells that we use for force measurement. Um, controllers are used uh, for computational and, and, alg and algorithmic work that is necessary for this whole uh, uh, algorithm and for this whole uh, setup. And um, there are also input output peripherals that are necessary. So here I am presenting the experimental setup that I had. Um, and pretty much it uh, comprised of a host PC, which ran the MATLAB simulating software suite. And uh, this is where the numerical modeling and the compensation algorithms and everything are embedded. Once the code is compiled, it's uh, sent as source code, uh, which is C++ into a controller. Um, as the controller, we had a speed code target machine and the target machine had all the input output peripherals and all the computational capabilities that we are interested in. And so via analog input output channels, uh, my controller communicated with my servo controller, which is a Shore Western SC6000. And my servo controller managed how the actuator is behaved. And so via a command boundary condition, uh, the servo controller is responsible for deforming my physical specimen here. And so once the physical specimen deforms, of course, you're gonna have your load cells pick up on the forces. So we have load cell measurements go back. And also we have external potentiometers for purposes of uh, uh, feedback and also uh, verification measurement. And so we have external potentiometers connected to the controller as well. And the physical specimen is located here in the middle. And I guess the last thing is that um, the LDCBs are powered by hydraulic oil and the, the pump supply we had was at 10 gallons per minute at 3000 PSI nominal. Okay, so here I am introducing the multi-axial real-time hybrid simulation framework that I've proposed. Um, this is for the purposes of nonlinear dynamic testing of structures under natural hazards and uh, this provides a realistic way of testing uh, structural systems because for one, you get your reference structure and it's broken down into numerical and physical components and you're only testing the components you're interested in. And secondly, you have the capability of testing more than one physical substructure, which can add realism to your experiments. And so um, at the interface with your numerical substructure, you have all the signals which are measured uh, and sent out in Cartesian, uh, Cartesian coordinates and at the location of the physical specimen, you are working, working with actuators. So you are working with actuator signals. And in between the two, you have transformation layers, which uh, really condition your signals and are able to make the physical and numerical constructs communicate with each other. So I'm gonna talk about numerical uh, substructure first. The input into my numerical substructure is any kind of excitation force. It could be an earthquake, it could be a tornado, it could be a train load. And also the feedback force that comes from the load cells uh, from the experimental uh, substructure. Uh, the uh, numerical model is constructed via the governing uh, set of equations or just finite element modeling, which is converted to state space model. And uh, I use the MATLAB simulating software suite. This is where the model is developed and compiled into source code on the controller. And the controller is, is what's doing the computational analysis of the model and it's what's giving you the output. And the output of this entire process is a Cartesian target boundary condition. And um, the numerical substructure used an eighth order Rangakata algorithm. And again, every time I say Cartesian, what I mean is X, Y, and Z coordinates. So we already talked about numerical substructure. What I'll do is I'll get to each of these uh, elements one by one. Uh, the next is the physical substructure. And by the way, this whole thing is taking place at in, in real time. So if your simulation is running at a thousand hertz, an entire loop is actually happening at one thousandths of a second. So your forces are being imp imposed in real time at real uh, natural hazard excitation speeds and your computation is done very rapidly too. So uh, the physical substructure is realized when an actuator control signal is directed uh, through a servo controller and analog to digital converter uh, conditions the signal uh, for execution by the physical specimen. Um, my servo controller is shown here as a show restaurant and the physical uh, system is the load on boundary condition box plus the physical specimen. Uh, there are load cells here and sensors that pick up on any kind of necessary information we need. 
And there is an analog to digital converter, which then gives us experimental data, anything we're interested in, and also the actuator forces which are needed. And again, all of this is done in real time. Forces are imposed in real time because this is a real time testing algorithm. Now, before we move any further, we should really talk about uh, the concept of kinematic transformation. And um, if we're working with a load and boundary condition box, like I've shown here, these boxes have a fixed space. And on this fixed space, I like to assign a Cartesian reference frame. Uh, there is also a moving platform where I uh, assign a Cartesian reference frame at the location with the physical specimen. And there's also the strong floor, uh, which has a reference frame of its own because we use external potentiometers and we want to find out uh, how they extend and contract. And uh, so, of course, uh, anytime you want to have a uh, Cartesian realization, you want to move your moving uh, platform, each of these actuators have to work independently to achieve that final result. And so uh, the process of going from Cartesian coordinates, so Cartesian coordinates, to linear coordinates, which could be your actuator or external potentiometers, this we call inverse kinematics. And the process of going from actuator strokes back to Cartesian coordinates, that's called forward kinematics. So uh, let's talk about the, some of the algorithms that are necessary. Um, in parallel manipulators like LBCBs, um, when you want to go from Cartesian to actuator uh, strokes, this task is actually very easy to do so because you know where your uh, fixed uh, frame of reference is, you know where your moving frame of reference is, and you can draw three-dimensional vectors to the locations of the joints through the actuators back to the location of the other reference frame. And this arithmetic can be done quite easily, and the mathematics for that is shown here. Now, if you are given the strokes of the actuators and you want to find out what the Cartesian uh, motion is, that's a hard task for a Cartesian, uh, or excuse me, for a parallel manipulator. Um, because you end up uh, inversing this problem, which gives you an implicit uh, uh, set of nonlinear equations of uh, kinematics. Uh, usually iterative solutions are necessary for solving them and they're just really hard to do so and they may not guarantee any good results. So what we typically do is we linearize the nonlinear set of equations uh, around the equilibrium position uh, via Taylor expansion. And uh, we end up with these uh, two relationships. One is for the potentiometers, one is for the actuators, and we get these Jacobians. And you can kind of think of these Jacobians as being the tangent uh, whenever you take a derivative of a function. Another very important thing is system identification because we use model-based comp compensators. And uh, so uh, the term system here uh, refers to actuator structure dynamics um, and system identification is the process of minimizing the error uh, between your system response and your system model response. And so there is an identification algorithm here. And so uh, what we did is uh, we always start with a process of data collection from our experiments. Uh, we need to select the structure of the model. So if you're working with uh, transfer functions, you're gonna have uh, poles and zeros. You wanna know how many poles and zeros you have. Uh, there is the process of model estimation. There is the process of model validation. If you don't get acceptable results, you ideally wanna go back and repeat this whole thing again and uh, verify that you get the good results. Once you have good results, then we can move to controller design. And because we work in frequency domain, uh, ideally I wanna convert all my signals to frequency domain via Fourier transform. Um, I want to take advantage of the frequency response function idea, which shows you how a system behaves in frequency domain. However, we can't do this directly. We need to do uh, estimations of the FRF. And there's an H1 algorithm. Uh, there's also an H2 algorithm. Um, H1 is an FRF estimation uh, where the output is expected to be noisier than the uh, input. And H2 is an approach where the input is expected to be noisier than the output. And there is also a coherence function which we need for the purposes of system identification. And coherence function measures the extent to which an optimum linear least square relationship uh, can predict the measurement given the excitation. And uh, really, whenever you get a value of one, uh, it means that the uh, frequencies are very much accessible at that uh, at that uh, or, or um, at that value. 
uh, or uh, and and the system is linear and noise free. So uh, that's the idea of the coherence function. And uh, I used a, a software called MFDID, uh, which did my system ID for me. I pretty much gave it the frequency response functions, and it uh, fit the uh, transfer function models with uh, my frequency response uh, input data. And the software has its own um, algorithms. There is an estimation step, there is an improvement step, and the final optimization step. All righty, let's get back to the framework. Uh, we've talked about numerical uh, substructure. We've talked about the experimental physical substructure. Now I want to talk about the transformation layers in between. OK, so the N2P process uh, is a numerical to physical uh, transformation process. Uh, if you remember from the numerical substructure, we obtained a Cartesian target boundary condition that came out of the numerical uh, model. We also have measured potentiometer displacements, and this came out of the experiment. And so uh, when I say Cartesian uh, boundary conditions, what I mean is this Cartesian motion here uh, at the location with the physical specimen. Uh, then there is a series of target inverse kinematic transformation, transducer uh, forward kinematic transformation, and actuator inverse kinematic transformation. And what you end up with is a number of actuator signals which we then need to compensate for because actuators don't listen to us. And so there is a decoupled control algorithm, which I will talk about in a second. And the output of this whole mechanism is the actuator control signal. And um, this whole algorithm, this whole N2P algorithm is ran on a controller. And in our case, this was a speed goat target machine. So let's talk about the decoupled uh, controller. Uh, it will get a little mathematical here, but um, the question is, what is a decoupled controller? So when uh, kinematics of an LBCB are considered in actuator coordinates, there is actually minimal coupling between each of the actuators. So uh, whenever you consider in uh, Cartesian coordinates, you're considering the motion of the moving platform in Cartesian coordinates, there is actually significant, significant coupling between the actuators. So because we are considering um, our signals in actuator coordinates, there is actually minimal coupling. And so we are able to compensate for each of the actuators independently as shown here. So we have six control algorithms for the six channels of the uh, LBCB. And so each of these channels um, is a modified model-based controller that I've also developed. And really uh, what happens is you have your plan dynamics and this is your um, actuator structure dynamics. Uh, there is a feed forward controller and there is a feedback controller. Uh, the feed forward controller is an inverse nominal dynamic model. It's knowledge based. So you need to know what the dynamics of your um, physical system is. That's why we call this whole thing model based controller. Uh, there is a feedback controller, uh, which is error and knowledge based. So we need to know what the error is between your measurement and your reference signal. And we need to know the model of the plan dynamics. Um, feedback controller is tricky because it results in a cause and effect loop where the feedback control affects your plant and your plant affects your feedback controller. And so you may have stability issues and that has been a problem. And this was a problem that one of our colleagues actually had to deal with. And so, um, we are given a plan dynamics, uh, which is my uh, structure um, actuator dynamics. And what I can do is I can invert this and I can cascade it with a low pass filter. And low pass filter is just for the uh, having a causal realization. So you have enough poles um, also for, um, for reduction of high uh, frequency amplification. And um, this is what the feed forward controller is. This is an inverse uh, model feed forward controller. Um, there is a feedback controller, which is a simple LQG design. Uh, based on this relationship here, um, when the plant and the feed forward control are cascaded, you get a low pass filter. So the LQG is based on the cascaded action, which is a low pass filter. And uh, this low pass filter is shown here in a state space formulation with input noise and output noise. And these noises are assumed to be stationary and zero mean processes. And that's what really the whole notion of LQG is, linear quadratic Gaussian. And uh, um, for obtaining the feedback control, all we have to do is to minimize this quadratic cost function. And that gives us our uh, feedback controller um, in an LQG optimal sense. <laughs> 
<clears throat> this here is a quick, uh, quick uh, proof of the stability guarantee for my modified controller. So uh, let's say I have a linear uh, operator Q and a stabilizing feedback controller K where the amplitude of K is less than or equal to one. Then uh, I plus QK inverse is non-singular and realizable if Q is less than one. Uh, so if you go back to the high school years, you know, we talked about um, uh, negative uh, uh, feedback loop or positive feedback loop. Uh, this is the negative feedback loop uh, in a mathematical description. So this is a sufficient only condition. So when this is satisfied, you have uh, stability guarantees. However, when this is not satisfied, it doesn't mean you have instability because physical systems have um, frictions and, and little things that we um, cannot explicitly see and those can prevent instability. Um, for, um, so for some stabilizing feedback controller uh, K, and I'm using the infinity gain here, uh, less than and equal to one, the modified model-based controller, and this is the denominator of the closed loop uh, system. So this is uh, non-singular when uh, the gain of uh, the low pass filter multiplied by the gain of the uh, feedback controller is less than one. And gain of a low pass filter is always one. And so this architecture guarantees stability when the feedback gain is less than or equal to one. So this is a way of uh, designing your feedback system and guaranteeing that it doesn't um, jeopardize the stability of your uh, control loop. <clears throat> okay, so uh, the last step in this whole thing is the physical to numerical uh, construct uh, or transformation. And this is really easy. You uh, measure your actuator forces via the load cells that are in line with your actuators. And you ideally want to convert this into Cartesian coordinates. And uh, this process involves multiplying actuator forces with the Jacobian we got earlier. And this Jacobian is, again, from the linearization process. So um, this uh, force transform process is an approximation of the actual force transformation. If you want to do the actual force transform, that's a nonlinear process. And this whole numerical to physical uh, transformation is done on a controller. OK, so we talked about methodology. Let's present experimental results. Um, I want to talk about uh, some of the work that my colleague, Dr. Fermandois, did. Um, in his multi-axial development, by the time your signals arrived at your controller, these signals were already converted to Cartesian coordinates. And because your signals are in Cartesian coordinates, your controller is also a Cartesian controller. And for a parallel, parallel manipulator, uh, you have considerable coupling that exists between the actuators when you are thinking in Cartesian coordinates. So um, in fact, uh, the controller he had to design was a coupled uh, multi-input, multi-output type controller, which is really difficult to design and optimize for a physical system. People do numerical studies all the time and it works, but whenever you wor work with control of a physical system, this is extremely difficult to do. And um, because of this difficulty, he was not able to uh, uh, successfully uh, show the, uh, successfully have stable results and he had to truncate his uh, rotational degree of freedom. Uh, so let's see, okay, there we go. So uh, yeah, he had to truncate the rotational degree of freedom which where he was having instability issues and uh, he was only working with one degree of freedom. Okay, so what I want to do now is to really distinguish my work from the work that he did. And this involves uh, talking about the compensation algorithms that we had. Um, he used the model-based controller and I used the modified model-based controller. And um, I talked about this a little bit now, but in my prelim, I talked about this considerably more, but uh, the modified model-based controller uh, I showed had better uh, uh, tracking performance uh, and stability and robustness. The um, control uh, algorithm that he used uh, was uh, done in Cartesian coordinates. Mine were done in actuator coordinates. And of course, actuator coupling is greater in Cartesian coordinates. Uh, another thing is the whole notion of uh, controller coupling. Because his uh, control was done in Cartesian coordinates uh, and, he, and he had to use multi-input, multi-output type controllers, um, that task of designing and optimizing was considerably harder. In my case, I used the single input, single output type controller, and this was considerably easier to design and to operate and to tune and so forth. 
Um, and so what I can say is that MIMO controllers are harder to design and optimize. <clears throat> and because of the instability problems he had, uh, he was only able to run experiments in one degree of freedom. And in my early work, uh, I showed that I was able to move my physical specimen in a planar manner, so in a two degree of freedom uh, manner with the vertical ignored. Um, and so it's one versus two DOF. Um, since my prelim exam, I've increased this to six degrees of freedom, as I will talk about. Uh, before we go there, I want to quickly go back to my uh, um, uh, progress before my prelim exam. And what I had done was I had uh, the, this moment frame structure where I physically substructured one of the columns. And it was uh, tested in a physical uh, way using an LDCV. So a ground motion acceleration was introduced into this uh, moment frame structure. And in the next slide, I'm going to show you some of the results. Uh, so here we have uh, the behaviors of degree of freedom one and two uh, shown in the elastic range. So I minimized the amplitude of my acceleration and I compared my MARTHS results uh, with uh, results of a numerical model. And there is very good agreement in degree of freedom one and two and uh, Cartesian coordinates are shown here as well. And then um, I increased the amplitude, amplitude of my ground motion and I showed that you can have nonlinear hysteretic behavior in both degrees of freedom. And I also did a damping study where I decreased the damping of my numerical uh, substructure and I showed that I had uh, very good stability. And in the past that had been a, a key source of problem for RTHS tests where you've had to artificially bump up your dampling value. And so uh, my next objective since my prelim exam has been expanding this work um, and having the possibilities of having multiple uh, physical um, uh, interfaces. And uh, studies like this have been done in the past where uh, Mahmoud et al. did a, a slow speed hybrid simulation uh, with uh, multiple interfaces. Uh, Abdel Nabi in 2014 did a study uh, as well, but again, these were done at slow speed hybrid simulation. I want to do this using the small scale dynamic LBCVs in real uh, at real speeds. So um, I used my multi-axial uh, RTHS framework, uh, and um, we did the introduction before. But here, I'm going to take this framework and I'm going to validate it through uh, experimental testing. So. Um, this here is an illustrative example involving a multi-span curved bridge uh, structure where I took two of the peers and I physically tested them and the rest of this structure is numerically modeled. Uh, the uh, boundary conditions uh, with the physical specimens are color coded. These are colors I will be referring to down the road, but red means left physical specimen and green means a middle uh, peer. So um, the deck of this bridge is uh, curved, and I estimated it uh, via 16 linearized deck segments, and the material used is uh, steel for repeatability. The um, eigenmodes of the bridge are given as shown. These are just the first six, um, and so you have the eigenvalues, uh, and you have the mode shapes. And I verified, um, of course, I did my modeling in a Simulink model. Uh, so I had to verify my model with a SAP 2000 model. And uh, for the first 20 eigenmodes, I get a very good match between the two models. Um, for everything above that, um, the models uh, are not so good. And the reason is SAP 2000 uh, discretizes your model to smaller increments. And so it can give you different results. And so um, then I had to system identify my, uh, my uh, physical substructure, the LBCBs. So the LBCBs have, uh, each of them have uh, six channels and we're seeing the amplitude curve and the phase curve. Uh, the off diagonal terms are referring to the coupling that exists between these uh, actuator channels. So the on diagonal terms are referring to the decoupled uh, um, or uh, the motion of the actuator itself. So, from these amplitudes, what we can see is that uh, the uh, off diagonal terms are actually considerably smaller than the on diagonal terms. So um, even though coupling exists uh, very in a, in, a, in a small manner, we can assume it's uh, negligible. And this was something I did, and this was a byproduct of considering everything in actuator coordinates. So I only system identified the on diagonal terms. <clears throat> 
So uh, this here is the result of my system ID. Um, I am uh, working with two LBCBs. Each of them have six actuators. And again, we're assuming actuator coupling is negligible and that uh, actuators are behaving linearly. That's why I'm using a transfer function model. So uh, then I did uh, two experimental scenarios. And the two uh, scenarios that I considered are uh, the elastic case and the nonlinear case. Um, so for the elastic case, I have a biaxial ground motion uh, entering my uh, numerical substructure. And so the amplitude is uh, considerably smaller than for the nonlinear case. And so I do a uh, tracking analysis via this uh, notion of synchronization subspace plots. So what I'll do is I'll uh, plot the target uh, boundary condition with the measured boundary condition. And if I get perfect tracking, I should have a 45 degree angle line. Uh, if there's an undershoot, I will get a line that looks like that. If there is overshoot, I'll get a line that looks like that. And if there is delays between the two signals, I'll get a elliptic shape. So um, here I am presenting the results for the UX degree of freedom. I am showing the results for LBCB1 above and results for LBCB2 down below. Um, I'm showing how without the control case here, so in the no control uh, scenario, uh, there is an elliptic shape to this synchronization subspace plot. And this shows you that there is considerable delay. With the uh, addition of the feed forward control, this uh, ellipse becomes a line uh, or almost a line. So this is better behavior. There is less uh, delays. In the LBCB2, we had uh, a little bit of undershoot, and this was fixed with the addition of the feedforward control. Uh, there is a, <clears throat> a feedback control added, uh, which is hard to see here uh, how it improves, but here I'm showing the normalized errors, and uh, we can see from the normalized errors that the addition of the feedback can actually uh, improve the uh, tracking behavior. And also it does add robustness features to your, uh, to your uh, closed loop behavior. And um, I then introduced two tracking error criteria. One is the root mean square error. One is the maximum normalized error. And we can see with the addition of uh, sophistication in the control algorithm, we're getting a reduction in the, uh, the tracking uh, error. And we can see the reduction in error in both maximum errors and root mean square of the errors. And so what I can say is that my modified model-based controller improves tracking performance of the reference signal. And here uh, I am again just showing the UX uh, degree of freedom and I'm doing the elastic uh, study where I compare my numerical results with the results of my MARTHS test. So um, I have uh, my uh, displacement, this is my boundary condition and I have my forces and I am showing you how uh, the uh, experimental test is actually matching uh, numerical tests for both LBCVs. And so uh, this here is a tracking study of all the other channels. Uh, what I have done is I have truncated the vertical degree of freedom in the Y direction. The reason for that is that for a millimeter of uh, compression in the uh, axial direction of the physical specimen, I needed to impose a massive amount of force, which could potentially damage my load cells. So at this direction, I truncated out. So I have five degrees of freedom left for each of the LBCBs. And I'm showing you the tracking behavior along with the RMSC and max E values. And if you remember, my colleague had issues uh, tracking rotational degrees of freedom. But what you can see here is that there is pretty good uh, tracking in the rotational uh, DOFs as well. OK, so this will be tricky because I'm going to show you a clip. Uh, I don't know how Zoom behaves with clips, but I'm going to show you the uh, substructuring process of the bridge. And then there is an experimental video. I hope it comes across as well. Um, if not, um, I apologize. Um, this is going to be a quick 30 second video. 
so I'm not going to show any more because um, the vibration becomes pretty small at the very end. But what I like to highlight here is that I did a nonlinear study where uh, for LBCB1 in the UX degree of freedom, which is also demonstrated here, I was able to get a nonlinear hysteretic behavior. And so number one, I, I proved that this methodology can give you nonlinear dynamic results. And number two, the tracking uh, behavior remains very good uh, in this actuator channel, at least. I will show the other actuator channels now. Uh, so we have the five other channels. This is the results for LBCB1. And these results are also pretty good. And again, uh, the problem we had in the uh, development from 2017 was that we couldn't get the rotational degrees of freedom to stabilize. And uh, so these results are very good. And then I am gonna, I'm here, I'm showing you the hysteretic, uh, no, the nonlinear hysteretic results for each degree of freedom, uh, X, Z, and uh, so forth. Uh, so these are the, uh, so all, almost all the channels are in the nonlinear range now. And so um, there was a request during my prelim exam uh, session to study uh, friction and inertial behaviors of the LBCBs. So what I did was I studied the friction behavior in the X direction and the Z direction. And when I say Z, it's the out of plane direction. It's just how I've set my uh, coordinate system. And um, when we talk about friction, um, in this case, I'm interested in Coulomb friction uh, because I have this actuator which has um, the velocity damp uh, uh, friction inside it. But I'm not going to consider that because the actuator is actually on the other side of my load cell. So there is a swivel joint, there is the uh, moving platform, and there is the physical specimen. And here I'm analyzing uh, Coulomb friction which is really uh, the friction to get an object moving. And this was almost like a high school level friction that we've all studied. And so I looked for this kind of uh, behavior by imposing uh, a sinusoidal excitation signal uh, in the X and the Z directions in both LBCBs. And I'm showing you results for LBCB number two. Um, and as it turns out, uh, for uh, both LBCBs and both directions, uh, th this force is actually quite small. Um, so I have listed them here in the X direction. Um, the biggest force we're dealing with is roughly 60 newtons. And that's, that's pretty small, given that we work with uh, forces that are in the kilonewton and multiple kilonewton range. Um, then I did an inertial study where the physical uh, specimen is removed. <coughs> so. With the removal of the physical specimen, you have uh, your stiffness uh, restoring forces taken out. And uh, I can then run my RTHS and uh, measure the accelerations, uh, the inertial components uh, in my moving platform. And of course, you can't neglect inertia. So you'll, you'll always get inertia plus friction force. And so um, I'm going to show you the results for this. Um, so with the specimen, we have uh, in the X direction, the force is going up to three, uh, three kilonewtons, in the Z direction, up to two kilonewtons. However, we can see without the specimen, the inertial force is actually very tiny. Uh, it's on the order of 0.5% uh, of the total force uh, in both directions. Uh, so these are results from LBCB number one. So uh, what I can say is that both fric friction and inertial components of the forces are negligible. Okay, so we're almost there. Uh, let's talk about some concluding remarks. Um, and um, the uh, multi-axial real-time framework with uh, multiple boundary interfaces is an expansion on the existing developments in hybrid simulation that allows for realistic assessment of rate-dependent structures. And this is useful for natural hazard engineering and other kinds of uh, experimental testing. Uh, I used the modified model-based controller in a decoupled control manner, and that allowed for very um, that allowed for ease of design and very uh, easy and uh, smooth uh, tracking of the uh, actuator channels. Uh, this framework was implemented and validated using a, a small-scale LBCB setup that we have here at U of I, and the experimental results demonstrated good performance in the linear and nonlinear um, phases. Uh, in the future, I wish to expand this work and uh, uh, work on the notion of mixed mode control, where you are doing tracking of both forces and displacements. Often um, in earthquake engineering applications, we may be interested in imposing gravity loads uh, along with the regular displacement boundary conditions.
Uh, I want to improve the uh, forward kinematic transformation process. Um, as we discussed, I had to linearize around an equilibrium position. So perhaps in the future, I can linearize around new equilibrium positions at every time step, or just be able to rapidly estimate the solution of my nonlinear uh, equation of motion. I want to uh, make use of machine learning algorithms and really bring, bring that role into hybrid simulation. Uh, for one, I could use it for purposes of model reduction. So if you have a numerical model that has hundreds of degrees of freedom, perhaps uh, we can use neural networks uh, to give us a more computationally efficient way of representing this numerical model and also use neural networks, for instance, to capture nonlinear finite element modeling. Uh, nonlinear models are very numerically burdensome, so perhaps uh, machine learning can help in that front. Uh, machine learning has already proven to be very useful in actuator compensation. They've used it in nonlinear uh, control uh, systems, and they can also be used for real-time system ID, um, which can be very useful. And uh, lastly, I want to do more uh, stability guarantee studies, uh, like some of the studies that I've already done. Um, so in real-time hybrid simulation, we always have instability issues that we need to be very uh, aware of. Um, so these include uh, sufficient only uh, or sufficient stability conditions using uh, concepts like the small gain theorem, like the one I talked about, and uh, using more necessary uh, type uh, stability conditions, which can give us more, uh, which require an analyzing more uh, explicit uh, uh, physical laws, uh, damping values, things like that. Uh, and so this is really what I like to explore. Well, I thank you for your time and I'll pass it back to Dr. Spencer. Uh, if the audience has any questions, I'm more than willing to answer. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ali. Uh, so are there any, any questions from the 